Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Amongst the news items we have for you this week, caffeine could reduce your risk of diabetes and a decreased body fat content, or at least so claims one study. The oral polio vaccine is not causing a polio epidemic, or at least so says the skeptical raptor. A naturopath has continued to dig their hole ever deeper by now being banned from making any fecal transplants for autistic children, despite having attempted to fight it out in court. An enzyme could be playing a role in depression for some individuals. There is now an approval in England for the development of commercial-level gene-edited food. This means you may see fields upon fields of gene-edited crops that will be harvested and distributed to individuals willing to buy them. Australia has had a large case of fish dying in ridiculous numbers due to hypoxia, that being lack of oxygen in the river. At least five planets will align in the sky this week. Unfortunately, not everybody will be able to see this. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. Starting with caffeine and the risk of both diabetes and body fat content. If your first step in the morning is to put on the kettle or make a pot of coffee in order to consume caffeine, you may be at significantly less risk of developing a type 2 diabetes and have cardiovascular events happen to you, things like heart attack or stroke. The evidence indicates that serum levels or plasma levels of caffeine reduce both BMI and type 2 diabetes risk, which is an interesting relationship. Admittedly, the study is limited by the nature of what it is. It is based basically on UK and Swedish data. It is worth making a note that there is a very distinct relationship between these three things in terms of what's happening in the observed end result. As a general rule, caffeine does elevate the body's physiological activity, things like increasing heart rate. This in turn does have an effect on metabolism, a slight effect, but an effect nonetheless. From here, you do get a reduction in body mass, by virtue of the fact that you are burning more energy. If you reduce body mass, you then reduce risk of type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes then has a carry-through effect on what people are actually doing, and therefore you get something of a cyclical feedback loop that increases caffeine consumption to some extent, while reducing the negative effects of the others. Conversely, somebody who is either obese or is diabetic is less likely to be as active simply because their condition makes it harder. All of this sounds great in theory. The problem is practice. This study, like others we've mentioned recently, is fundamentally limited by the same issue. That is, it relies on genetic database information. Admittedly, a very large sample of 10,000 people, but still, it is limited by the data that has already been collected. There is no new data, so to say, it's just an analysis of existing data sets. The researchers have also proposed their own explanation as to exactly what caffeine is doing. And what they have to say is that caffeine increases the conversion of fats into energy and then heat. This overall is what drives down BMI or body mass index and therefore cardiovascular risk. Next is definitely not happy medical news. It's that America or the USA has hit a peak, a 60 year peak of maternal death. That is women who died during pregnancy or shortly thereafter. It is the highest it has been since the 60s. There are various parts of the internet that are crying out at present that this is all down to vaccinations for COVID-19 and that this is causing the sudden increase in maternal death. The reality is no, no. The impact of COVID-19 was an overall decrease in employment, income and a massive increase in cost of living. This has led to exacerbation of existing problems with healthcare in America. Notably, in America, you pay for your healthcare and there is nothing available publicly, which means you have a choice between crippling medical debt or 
being able to afford food and housing and just about every other thing you'd pay for regularly. Of course, that means that if you have a choice between uh, returning to an OBGYN or pediatrician to, to follow up with either the uh, child or mother, that's going to happen less frequently. And certainly it's going to be a much more realistic aspiration for those who can't afford it. The fact that now not only do we have to worry about unemployment due to COVID-19, but that everything else is costing so much more due to inflation, fewer people are able to get their way back to a doctor post-pregnancy or to have the long-term necessary care after a, a complicated pregnancy. This is one of the major reasons why the maternal death rate has risen the way it has. Of course, this is not a uh, single factor scenario. There are multiple factors that all come into play and are what are leading to the uh, current situation. Another complicated situation is the uh, issue to do with polio in Africa and claims that it's uh, all due to the vaccine causing an epidemic. This is somewhat more complicated and definitely not an accurate depiction of the scenario. Polio itself is made up of three different viruses, or groups. One, two, and three, unsurprisingly, are they named. What happens is that polio gets into the body, gets into the GI tract, and then you get a transmission through the fecal-oral route. Occasionally, other vectors exist, but this is the primary one of concern. The vast majority of cases have no symptoms to speak of. There's about a 1%, or often cases less, who do show symptoms. Unfortunately, of the symptomatic cases, about half a percent of these end up having their central nervous system affected as the disease moves from the GI tract into the nervous system, resulting in paralysis. Once this happens, there is no treatment available. The paralysis is for life, and that's why the up to 5% of children and 30% of adults who die from this are a very big hit, let alone those who survive but have paralysis for life. There have been two versions of the polio vaccine available for a very long time, the oral vaccine and an injected vaccine. The original vaccine was the injectable vaccine and this was developed by Jonas Silk and is perhaps the more famous of the two. The second is more commonly used, especially in countries that are still developing. It uses a live, attenuated virus given orally as a few drops in the mouth. And this is where the big difference comes into play. The oral polio vaccine uses an attenuated virus, that is one that has been weakened. Unfortunately, on rare occasions, that weakened virus can mutate, as any virus is prone to do. When this happens, you can wind up with a virus that's the attenuated version, but also still pathogenic. And this is where you need to separate out those who receive the injected vaccine and those who receive the oral vaccine. The injected vaccine does not use the attenuated virus. The oral vaccine does. And so only those who've received the oral vaccine, which has not been used in most developed countries for over 20 years now, are the only ones that can develop the mutated version of the virus from the oral vaccine, and therefore the only ones who can transmit that particular version if they have not been vaccinated with the injectable version. Given the uh, impact of not being vaccinated, and the sheer number of people who can die from not being vaccinated, it is a very small fraction of those who have developed complications given the sheer quantity of the oral vaccine that's been administered each year, and the very small number of cases, it's clear that any claims of an epidemic being driven by it are well and truly overblown. It's the same way that to some extent, the outbreak in Europe of stomach Botox paralysis is somewhat overblown as well. Why you would want to inject Botox into your stomach is honestly quite bizarre, but for some reason, two private hospitals in Turkey had patients undergoing just that. The idea was, somehow, that by injecting Botox into their stomach or stomach region, they would lose weight, and, well, death is one way of losing a few kilograms, just not how most people would choose to do so. 
Botulism is a very nasty toxin to be using for any purpose. The fact that it's used relatively readily for Botox therapy, basically firming up the facial muscles, is already a questionable practice. Using it in the stomach to try and lose weight is a dumb practice. This is why the 67 cases spread across a number of different countries including Turkey, Germany, Austria and Switzerland are all not only dumb but interesting. Many of them have at least had a bad time but not required intensive care while a number have. The way the botulinum toxin works is it's basically an inhibitor of neurotransmission. It prevents them from sending signals which can cause areas of the body to become relaxed. This is useful if you want to remove wrinkles temporarily. Where this particular example gets interesting is that where, for example, facial treatments are approved, they're also carefully monitored and done by somebody who's qualified for it. There are also well-established risk factor profiles associated with it. This is not so much true of the uh, stomach Botox that was being done in these hospitals. At least in Turkey, it's not approved. There are other countries where approval has been made on the premise that evidence shows that by inhibiting the neural activity around the stomach, you can increase the duration of feelings of satiation after eating, thereby reducing food consumption. There is a good reason why just about every treatment and medication is approved through a regulatory process. The first reason is simply that it ensures that the treatment does what it's intended to do. The second is for safety. The third and final is to know what can go wrong and how to deal with it. This is one reason why the BC naturopath who tried to fight their losing battle about giving autistic children fecal transplants is an idiot. There is very preliminary evidence that fecal transplants may help, and this is very tenuous evidence. The idea of giving someone an experimental treatment that's not even being run as part of a clinical trial is not okay. This is why the Canadian naturopath was in so much trouble to start with. They were using an unproven, not even clinically tested, treatment in the uh, manner that they were and rather obviously without any medical qualifications. They're a naturopath, not an MD. Long story short is that uh, they were dragged before their own body of... I've got a degree in homeopathic medicine! You've got a degree in baloney. <laughs> Let's say uh, rather useless administrators to justify what they had done. They lost that case, they tried to take it to court, and they lost that case. Then they tried to appeal that decision, and that's where we are now, which they've also lost, unsurprisingly. To be very specific about it, it's not so much that they've lost their case as the appeals court refused to hear it, thereby sustaining the lower court's decision, which in turn means that the rather excoriating criticisms from the lower court still hold. Switching back to a real medicine of a kind and specifically the hormonal contraceptive pill that's taken orally, does appear to have some further risks associated with it. It's worth knowing in advance that the reality is the oral contraceptive pill as we know it today would never have been approved under modern clinical testing standards. The simple reality is that the side effects are too extensive, too serious, and pose too much risk that it would be possible to get it approved. Thankfully, this was done well before those standards came in, and they can't exactly rescind it now. Well, they could, but it would be a very unpopular decision. The problem with the oral contraceptive pills exist beyond what we already know, and it's one reason why research into them is continuing. There is an indication that the progesterone-only pill may increase risk of breast cancer. Understand that we say may, as this is a, a very recent study, and it's also a relatively singular study. It's part of a larger body of research, but it is also something that it's worth taking with a grain of salt at this stage. To be blunt, even if the uh, risk is established as being what they claim, it is a, a very 
small increase in risk. That is, your risk of breast cancer rises by 25%. But when we say risk, we mean the relative risk. That is, the chances of you developing breast cancer are only increased by 25%, not that you have a 25% chance of getting it overall. When comparing that against the ability to control reproductive rights, it is a very tiny risk for a very big reward. The other caveat to this study is that while it uses a large use data set of about 10,000 women under 50 who had breast cancer between 1996 and 2017 and were using progesterone only contraceptives, the exact process isn't clear and it's not sure whether or not all of it is down to the contraceptive or if there are other factors that may come into play. Further medical news believes that there may be a relationship between a particular enzyme and depression. Well, there is a relationship, but not necessarily the way we understand it at this stage. One of the things that happens, particularly with the more common antidepressants like SSRIs, is that serotonin is not broken down by enzymes as readily, but nor are they taken up by the neuron again. This means that they can sit in the synaptic cleft and act on other neurons for a much longer period. This is where the novel research comes into play, but needs to be very, very carefully considered. It used a very small sample of 91 women between 18 and 45. There were also 98 women who were used as a control group. Those 91 women had depression, and they were trying to figure out serum levels of estradiol. Estradiol is a form of estrogen. The evidence indicates that there is a role to be played with estradiol in women with various pathologies that either lead to imbalances or differences in this hormone circulating around the body. The general idea is that the body uses it, what isn't used goes to liver, gets metabolized, and then put into the GI tract, where ideally it's reabsorbed and then reused. The idea in this study is that there are certain bacteria involved in that process of reabsorption that may explain what's happening. Their study found that using samples from women with depression, estradiol was much more degraded within the microbial sample than those women who were not depressed. In fact, there's about a fourfold difference between the two. So those who were depressed had a much higher degradation rate and therefore less of it reabsorbed. And this is an interesting example of where the GI tract microbiome may be indirectly interacting with the central nervous system and therefore altering our state of mind in one way or another. In other microbial news, we have a interesting virus. Uh, interesting may be a touch exaggerated. The difference between this virus and others is that it has a, a very long tail. It's 875 nanometers, where a typical virus may be as little as 135 nanometers. This leads to the question of what could possibly have put pressure on this virus to develop such an incredibly long tail, and led to its nickname of the Rapunzel virus. The first explanation is surprisingly simple, and that is that it infects one of the uh, hardiest bacterium to be around. It's the uh, Thermus thermophilus. This is a bacteria that lives in hot springs, and those temperatures reach above 77 degrees Celsius, 170 degrees Fahrenheit hot enough that it would arguably destroy most things that live in the same environment. This bacterium can survive there, and by virtue of that, it has a very hardy body. The virus, therefore, needs to be able to penetrate it, and that's what this very large tail is for. Going from evolutionary pressures to agricultural pressure, and that England has finally started to accept that genetically modified food is going to be necessary and allowing the commercial growth of it. Finally, in that Europe and England, at least until relatively recently being part of it, was very resistant to the idea of allowing genetically modified organisms to be used. GMOs have many benefits over other options. 
The most immediate and obvious is that it reduces the need for pesticides and herbicides. By virtue of the fact that you only need to apply a herbicide once or twice a year and apply no pesticides, as the plant can make it its own, you're not only reducing the cost to the farmer, but improving their profit margins and also protecting other animals or insects that you would inadvertently spray with the same pesticide. By virtue of the fact that you only need to spray fields once or twice in the early part of the growing season, you also reduce issues to do with poisoning soil or runoff. Those are just the immediate benefits. There are other benefits as well, for example, hardier crops that can grow in worse conditions. This is increasingly important given that the natural effects of seasons seem to be less and less cooperative, whether that is extreme drought or extreme rain. It is important for us to say that this only applies to England itself. Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland do not have the same approval at this stage, nor does it extend to genetically modified animals, only crops. So far, everything probably sounds very promising. Unfortunately, the uh, approval does come with a rather large catch. They're only allowing what they would consider naturally occurring genes to be used. This is part of why the approval is called the Precision Breeding Act. What they've basically allowed is for the genetic modification of any gene that would otherwise have been available by things like crossbreeding. This means that you can introduce genes from a, a lot of different sources, but not from other species, as you wouldn't be able to crossbreed them normally or naturally. So this is a, a very big caveat to what is an otherwise a very promising idea. Of course, you inevitably have idiots who are trying to argue that we don't know if genetically modified organisms and crops are safe, which is stupid. Not just because they have been tested for safety, but we've been eating genetically modified crops for a very long time now in one form or another. The difference is the precision with which we are making these changes. Where you would take a scattershot approach to changing genes by crossbreeding or atomic gardening, this is like a sniper shot, where it targets one very specific and one very narrow thing and makes that change. Given that the UK, or at least England within the UK, has approved this, it is possible that they could once again begin producing food at a scale where they are a net exporter. In other food and environment related news is uh, this interesting mushroom, and that's probably the best word for it, interesting. Mushrooms are the weird child of nature. What they do, how they grow, and a lot of their behaviours are just so very different to anything else that you would encounter. However, they are an extremely good source of protein, and could be a way of locking away or sequestering carbon back into soil, thereby making it available to plants to use for more practical applications on a large-scale farm. If not farming for the purposes of crop foods, it could be useful as a way of sustaining forestry plantations. By combining both forestry plantation and fungi cultivation, you both have the ability to grow trees and food in the same place, without any real net loss in available land. As far as making the most of available land, this is a very sensible solution. It does come with a couple of large catches. The first is simply that when you compare boreal forests, or basically those in the northern and southern latitudes, they can hold about twice as much carbon in the soil as those in the more temperate areas. That of course does mean that it's a viable way of supplementing production of things like protein-rich foods that are otherwise very land and food intensive, such as meat. Along a similar line of environmental news items, Australia has seen a uh, disquieting mass of dead fish, millions of them, and unfortunately the exact reason why isn't something you can do a lot about. It's all down to a heat wave and the unfortunate reality that it means oxygen is driven out of the water and the fish drowned. Going from environmental news to archaeological and architectural news about Notre Dame. <laughs> 
Notre Dame is, other than being rather famous for being the cathedral in Paris, is also more recently famous for having caught on fire. That fire has ripped it to pieces in many respects, and while Paris is in the process of rebuilding it, it's an opportunity to explore a lot of the features that were unknown until now. One of the most interesting discoveries at present is the use of what are basically giant staples made of iron to hold parts of the structure together. Some of these have been dated as old as the 1160s. The idea is that the iron is put into sockets in the stone, and in doing so it holds two bits of stone together, far more strongly than the mortar alone would have done. In astronomical news this week, at least five of the planets in our solar system will be lining up, these being Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, Uranus, and Mars. These will form an arc if you look through from March 25th to March 30th. You should find them towards where the moon is located. However, Jupiter may have already set by the time you're able to see what's going on, if it's after the 28th of March. The article we link you to in the description box below will tell you where and how to set up for the best view of these planets. The last news item we have for you this week is purely about the Sun, and what is described as a giant hole, and what is likely to be the consequential very impressive light show that will really only be visible across the USA unfortunately, well the USA and Canada. What you're going to see is the Aurora Borealis from New York to Washington. The Aurora Borealis will be driven by the solar winds that hit the northern poles, and as a result the change in atmosphere due to the interaction of energy to create light. Sadly for the rest of the world we're not going to be able to see this, but it's certainly quite a stunning event if you can get there in time to see what's happening. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.